All right. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to CERN and the control room of the CMS experiment, which I am sitting in right now. Uh, so it is really great to see so many of you connected. Um, and uh, I'm really happy that we were able to, to do this, uh, this visit here today. Um, so the way this is going to go is that we will start by uh, talking a little bit just to orient you as to where we are right now. Um, we're going to show you around in the control room for the CMS detector, which is where I'm, I'm sitting right now. Uh, and then we are going to go uh, or I will stay in the control room and, and talk to you all from here and be able to answer questions on the Q&A. Um, and my colleagues will, will help go underground and, and show the, the CMS detector. Uh, okay, should we maybe start with the, or the overview? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think that you should be able to see now the screen which is shared. So this shows a aerial overview of the local area where CERN is, is, is uh, located. Um, and what you see here as the yellow ring is the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, which is accelerating and colliding primarily protons, but also other elements. Um, other particles uh, at very, very high energies. And we are sitting out in the French countryside at the CMS experimental site. Uh, so CMS stands for Compact Muon Solenoid the Detector. Uh, so we're out in the French countryside about five kilometers or so from the Swiss-French border. Uh, for those of you who are connected to my modern physics class, uh, normally, when we have been having our lectures, I have been sitting on the main CERN site, which is on the other side of the LHC ring at the CERN Mayram. Uh, okay, so now that I've told you where we are, I should also make sure that I introduce myself for those who have not had a chance to meet me. So my name is Louise Skinnery. I am a uh, professor in the physics department at Northeastern, but I'm also a scientist working on the CMS experiment. So my research is focused on, um, on particle physics, experimental particle physics, and specifically uh, using the LHC and the CMS here at CERN in order to study uh, questions around how nature and our universe works on the very, very smallest scale. So usually I don't spend that much time in the actual control room. I'm sometimes uh, here because whenever the either the detector is turned on or when um, uh, or when we have any people underground for safety reasons, we have to have people here in the control room that help monitor both the detector and the safety of, of those underground. So should we Mary, why don't you go around? Show a little <laughs> bit more in the control room. Oh, yes. So Noemi is going to show around a little bit. So this is where we are sitting. Hi. <laughs> uh, so I'm joined for now by uh, my colleague Noemi, who is holding the camera, and Zoltan, who's helping out with the technical aspects as well. Um, and so right now you can see um, there's one person who is sitting who is the so-called shift leader. Um, so when the detector or when there's any work going on, we have people here to really 24-7. Um, and um, so the person here is, is uh, here for the afternoon evening shift, um, responsible for the safety of the detector and, and those underground. And on the other side here, which is currently unoccupied, but there's someone here um, normally probably just stepped out for a second, um, is these where the so-called technical shifter sits. So this is also someone who is here 24 seven, who is monitoring, um, has a ton of cameras of the underground areas that are monitoring what is going on. Um, and is also keeping track of 
the detectors is a very, very complex system. It uses um, various gases that are pressurized and um, that might be at uh, low or high temperatures and um, it's, it's making sure that everything is, is under control with the cooling and that the elevator is working. Um, we have various screens that you see here that are the so-called alarm screens. Um, so these are to capture if there is, for instance, a, well, there might be a water leak alarm, there might be a fire alarm. These usually don't happen. I mean, under normal circumstances, if nothing is, is going on, but every now and then something something might happen and we have to have people really here that can, that can take care of them. Um, and behind here, you also see the large so-called detector and infrastructure status panel. So normally when we are taking data, um, all of this should be green. Right now, CERN is actually in what we call a shutdown period. This is not because of COVID, it was planned already before. And these type of periods allow us to do work on the detectors and the experiments. So as you can see here, LHC is in shutdown. It says, for example, we see a red current associated with a magnet that says that the cryos uh, for the magnet is not ready. Um, what else do we have? It also is showing red because the detector is actually open right now. Um, and that's the area we'll, uh, we'll also go down later. Uh, yeah, and we also have various um, mechanisms for emergency shutdown for safety reasons of the entire detector, as you can see here. Um, and yeah, you can also almost see out there the uh, countryside, um, the so-called Jura Mountains, which are our local mountains, a little bit of snow on them. Uh, it's a bit cloudy today. And let's see, what else can we view? Right, so, so this first part is the so-called central aspect or the central side of the control room, which is deals with the safety and the, um, the operation of the full detector. Then on the other side of the control room, we have various workstations that are dedicated to the different sub detectors of the detector. Because as, as we'll see, the CMS detector is really built up almost like an onion structure of different types of detectors. Um, and so right now there's not that much work going on, um, as much as possible of the work uh, right now at CERN is happening from, um, people are working from home to the extent possible for obvious reasons. Um, but um, when we are in so-called commissioning, when we're testing uh, the detector and making sure that um, we can take data as, as we should, then there tends to be a, a lot of activity and a lot of people sitting here. Um, and I, I don't remember now, but one time when I was very bored on a shift, when I was doing a shift leadership, I counted the number of monitors in the CMS control room. And I think it's something like 120. I forget the exact <laughs> number, but there's a lot of them. Um, all right. And yeah, we also have some uh, first aid kits, as you can see. Ah, maybe we can see. Can we see the... the oh, no. Can, can we see the lock... Uh, Tell, tell them. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of safety that goes into the CMS detector and, and just everything at CERN at the LHC. Um, and in order to make sure that no one can accidentally go somewhere where they don't have the right training to be uh, or at the right time, um, we have these lock cabinets that, so for example, if I just come here a regular day when I don't have a reason to be here, I wouldn't be able to just take a key to go into some area underground. Well, indeed, Noemi is a very wrong example. <laughs> yeah, Noemi is one of the power. Noemi users. has uh, all the power <laughs> to do this all the time, um, but otherwise, like this can be controlled that uh, you're only able to access the relevant keys when you really uh, should be able to access them. Um, so. That's quite fun as well. Coffee area. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Why can't you be a sense of 
Yes, ah, please. yes, please. Yes, please. All right. So Noemi is going to walk over to the room, which is called SX5, where the CMS detector was actually assembled, put together. And sure we are good here yeah and so you know, is walking through here these green doors are doors that lead to the underground area where um she will go down in a little bit um walk over yeah so the um, the cms detector can i maybe see the um quickly um a picture of the detector. Oh yes. Well, well, sure. Naomi's, Oh no, actually, she's showing here. Let me let me talk about this okay. one. So this shows uh, what you can see here is the inside of a so-called dipole magnet, one of the very very strong magnets that are used in the actual LHC. And you see two pipes. Those are the two pipes that the two counter circulating proton beams move through in a vacuum, a very, very good vacuum, um, when they are moving around in the LHC. And um, the beam, so the, the, this so-called beam pipe is, is about an inch wide, um, roughly. When, uh, when the protons actually collide in the center of the detector, um, the LHC beam, so the proton beam, is squeezed together to roughly a, the thickness of a human hair. So that's how thick the beams are when they actually collide in the center of the detector. Of course, then they, at that moment, they move in the same beam pipe. Exactly, already. exactly, yes. Yeah. So, so when the proton beams are in the main LHC tunnel, when they're not about to collide in the center of the detector, they are in two separate beams for the two going in opposite direction, but then it's a merge to a, a central beam in the, in the middle of the detector. So there's a question from Josh. How often does the LHC have to go under routine maintenance to make sure everything is safe enough to code? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, under normal circumstances, we have um, these main shutdown periods that happen every two to three years, roughly, when there might be everything from a year, two years, um, to really be able to do more dramatic developments or upgrades to the system. We also usually have shorter shutdown periods during um, the winter break, the Christmas New Year break. Um, so typically there will be sort of a one, two month period at least when we are not running the experiments. Part of the reason why this is in the winter rather than at some other time is that the power that CERN as a whole when the LHC is operating is actually quite substantial. Um, I think that what people usually say is that when CERN is operating as its maximum capacity, it takes about the same amount of, of power as um, the city of Geneva. Mm -hmm. Something like a 200,000 so, inhabitant yeah. city. And Gen yeah, exactly. Geneva yeah. has about 200,000 people. Yeah, yeah. yeah we lost Noemi for a, for a moment. Okay, so just, just add you in the spotlight. Okay, as well. um, so Noemi will be will be back soon. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so the, the room that she is going to is the um, uh, so called SX five, um, ah, and she's back. I think where the detector was assembled. So as I mentioned earlier, the, the CMS detector is is really built up sort of like an onion structure. It has different layers, different components of different types of detectors that are specialized in identifying different types of particles. So there is a, so Okay, sorry. <laughs> that was my mistake, sorry about. <laughs> Accidentally got unmuted. Um, yeah, so in the in, I was saying the inner part of the detector is, um, which is a little hard to see here, but it's um, 
the, the innermost part is specialized in tracing electrically charged particles. It's called a tracker for and tracing charged just, particles. Let me just share this. Let me just show you. for a second. Okay, yeah. So here we have in the inner part the um, so-called tracking detector that traces electrically charged particles like an electron, a muon, but not a particle that doesn't have electric charge, like a photon would not be seen in that particle detector. And then we have what is called calorimeters that specifically measure the energy of different particles. So I think it comes from uh, calorie uh, for energy measure. Um, and that's what's been shown exactly here in green and, I think and this yellow. Show as well. Yeah, and this shows a-, a um, Just one section. Yeah, exactly. And, and so then we have the outer part, the blue, um, the red and the white is specifically detecting muons. And here we see a similar uh, figure, but instead just showing um, a part of a cross-sectional view of the detector that illustrates how different detectors record different information. Um, it can measure the energy of a, of a um, particle like an electron or, or a photon or it can trace a particle like a muon and based on that information we can deduce what happened in the proton collisions. So back to so-called SX5 um, and so what you see in the background is a live site or a real version picture of the CMS detector you will see the real thing soon um, but what's neat here is that this is the area where the detector was actually assembled. Um, and we actually seem to have some tracking modules. Uh, Zoltan, do you know where, what exactly this is that we are looking at? No, so there are some so-called silicon tracking modules. And I don't know. Ah, so I'm just I can, yeah, well, I, I don't know exactly, but first of all, sorry, I'm late. <laughs> I just joined and I remembered this was here. So I don't know exactly the provenance of these particular modules, but they're of course from the, from the tracker barrel. And there is uh, something in Italian that's written here. And I asked an Italian colleague and he didn't quite, he wasn't quite able to tell me what it meant but something, uh, probably some kind of prototype. I don't think this was, this was not installed because the tracker is currently installed now. So I think these were prototype modules. Okay, okay, yeah. So these, this is then um, some prototypes of before the, the real detector modules that actually went into the detector were built, um, but they are, look very, very similar to, to what is in the real detector. So that's neat that we could see them. Um, we also have here, this is kind of fun. You see what sort of looks like a submarine thing. Um, so this is part of the previous accelerator that was in the tunnel where the LHC is now before the LHC was was built. Um, and it's called the this was called the LEP accelerator, the large electron positron collider because it collided electrons with positrons. Um, and this structure that you see was um, what was used to generate the electromagnetic fields that accelerated the particles. These are called RF cavities, radio frequency cavities. And the technology in the LHC looks quite different from in LEP. It really looks ancient, but it's not that old. This is, um, what, 30, 40 years? 30 years. 30 years. Um, so maybe I can and, add a quick this is word. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, just uh, yeah, just a quick word. I mean, based on what's written here, uh, I don't know much of enough. This is a radio frequency cavity, but apparently this bubble on the top, according to the text, it reduces the energy consumption by thirty-five percent. So I think this is the total energy consumption of the accelerator. And uh, maybe just another quick word for context. I'm sorry if you already <laughs> brought this up or mentioned it, but. This is an accelerator element for the detect for the accelerator, right? Uh, so you have some of these. Nowadays, they're not too different, but nowadays the LHC uses superconducting radio frequency cavities. So they're kept at cryogenic temperatures. 
And I can maybe, maybe manage to show if I go over the fence really carefully, there's a long <clears throat> tube over there. I think that's a quadrupole. So that's one of the focusing elements or bending elements, but that's really the two main elements you have at the LHC uh, or really any accelerator, you must have an accelerator element and then a bending or focusing element. So uh, with that, maybe I can start heading downstairs. Does that sound good? Yes, I'm just gonna, can you pause for one second? Cause there was a question about how we move heavy objects around and we can actually see it. So the yellow thing in the ceiling is giant cranes that are used or can be used to move these very heavy um, detector pieces. So when um, under the, um, the picture of the detector that we were looking at before is an open so-called shaft. It's, it's the open access that goes 100 meters underground um, to where the detector is. So the detector is really straight down uh, here into this shaft. And so using these giant cranes, um, the slices of, of the detector could be lowered underground. Okay, but yeah, maybe let's uh, let's go underground. Okay, we'll start doing that. We were trying to show the shaft. Uh, it's really a lot of interesting things about it, actually. Uh, so, the first of all, the the cranes that you see right now are not the ones that were used to lower the the detector itself because those were too heavy. So the cranes that were used, it, some uh, company was contracted to do that work. And the cranes that they used were eventually employed uh, to build a World Cup stadium. So that's how big we're talking. And also something interesting is that the, the soil around here, uh, in this particular area, there is basically an underground river. So they had to actually freeze the water with liquid nitrogen in, in order to tunnel through. Maybe a quick, if, if you guys don't mind, there's a couple of cool exhibits here. And here, for example, you can see a superconducting magnet for CMS. And I'm trying to very, very specifically point out the strands of uh, niobium titanium. Uh, and you can, yeah, Noemi's going to try to point it out. There you go. So most of the bulk of the magnet is aluminum, I believe. And it's meant to keep or, or retain the structural integrity of the whole thing, because you can kind of imagine it, it's trying to tear itself apart. It's uh, generating such strong magnetic field. So here's one of these bars and you can see that it's mostly alum aluminum, except for these uh, small, these are niobium titanium strands or cables and they go uh, sort of along the cylinder of the magnet. And it's, I don't know if you've talked about it a bit, we can talk about it a bit more later if you like. <clears throat> also interesting when they were excavating and uh, freezing the soil with liquid nitrogen, they found some Roman coins. So, so for, they found remains of a, common, of a Roman villa. And uh, there's some coins here that I know for a fact are not genuine because uh, they have like a CERN stamp on it. I can't really show it. But for the longest time, I thought they were for real, like the coins that they found here, but they're not. Uh, some other cool exhibits, although you kind of already saw this, but this is also part of the tracker, but this is the region. And this uh, is what, it, what we call a pedal. So you can imagine that this, you take a piece and you make them into a disc and you seal the barrel with these guys and you get a tracker. And then here's another tracker barrel module. And you can kind of see these, these are what we call strips. I'm not gonna be able to show you why, but uh, yeah, anyway, they're, they're also a silicon-based uh, silicon detector. Yeah, maybe I can just okay. say, so, so these, these are exactly, it's a, a semiconductor um, for those of you who have heard about that, which I know is an, a number of you. We lost them again. So. Okay, so they are going to continue moving uh, towards the underground. Okay. Um, oh, and I think they're back. Andres, probably it is better if you if you 
try to go underground because the reception here yeah yeah, yeah. Is, is okay bad. so we we just uh, switched to the wi-fi and i think it dropped for a second okay so this is what we already saw before uh, so they are now going to continue um, and they will start with going uh, through these green doors which is the access point to the underground um, and I mentioned this for those of you who are in the modern physics class that CERN has retina scanners um, and um, for those of you who have seen the movie Angels and Demons, there that is featured in uh, in this movie. But the joke is that that's one of the few things that is actually right in that movie. Yeah, but yeah so I can, uh, Sultan. Sorry, go ahead. So, so I just just wanted to to make a uh, a remark on the the scanner. Uh, we used the model that is on the film that's in the film. We use that at the very beginning, but of course the ones that we are using now are several generations older. Ah, so there. they they now measure. I don't think I've seen. Uh, they're both, talking about both from eyes. Demon. I don't think I've yeah. seen it. Yeah. Uh, so they they now measure both eyes and also check for the blood circulation. Right. If you remember the film, you know why I exactly. Stated if you've this. seen the film, <laughs> you know why why it matters that they check for blood circulation. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and go through. It's a little tricky to do, but you have to batch or scan your dosimeter. And then this thing is also very per peculiar or particular about how many times you can cross some laser beams. And then let's see. So this is the retina scanner right now. Yeah. And so I managed to get through uh, even even things like having long hair and having you know anything that the thing is it's trying to make sure that you don't bring in any uh, equipment through there are we have specific ways we do that so that's one of the things that it's checking so if you sort of cross you know it kind of counts makes makes sure that you cross these lasers only twice for your feet uh, and your torso only once. So if your hair is in the way or something, then it will deny you access. So there's some photos here. These are, I'm gonna just show one, which I think is really cool. So this is the insertion of the tracker and this is the innermost part of our detector. There's even a, a smaller detector inside of this one, but uh, it's, it's kind of related, let's say. And you can see the size of the detector, the people in the photograph as well. Okay. This might be pre-shower. I'm actually not sure. Do you uh, know what this the is? Yeah, that's the pre-shower. Oh, cool. I, don't, I think I've never seen inside of the pre-shower. So this is something cool to think about is the, uh, you know, HG Cal is basically a big pre-shower. <laughs> so I, th I think people here don't know what HG Cal is. It's the one part of the so-called calorimeter detector, which will go in um, in the future upgraded version of the CMS detector. So yeah. they're now going into the elevator and I think we might lose them as they go down yeah. underground, we usually do. Um, but so this shows they're starting at zero Actually, uh, at ground level. Um, I think let's let's start at minus two. That's yeah, they will start at minus yeah. two. Yeah. Okay. Um, have we lost them already? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Definitely. So I think we already answered the we answered the question uh, at least from... partially, and on the ground, I think we we got back to this issue. Yeah. So I just just uh, put yes. it to be answered. So yeah, I think we're back, by the way, and I just wanted to quickly show the, the schedule. So this is today, and there, there's a lot of planning that needs to happen for different groups to do different work in the cavern simultaneously. And there's a lot of things to take into account. 
so now we're underground. Sorry if I interrupted. You can feel free to. No, I was uh, I was just gonna over. say to to everyone that if you have questions, um, please put them in the Q and A, and we'll try and answer as we go through. That's what I was gonna say. So I'm gonna I, I can show you guys quickly uh, where we keep the pet hamsters. Uh, there's this uh, model of CMS and we keep a pair of hamsters and okay that's a joke we don't actually keep hamsters um, but there's also something cool here let me see if i can show you guys this thing so this uh i don't even know what material i think it might be aluminum but i'm not sure no oh, this it's is copper. copper copper okay and water cool so this thing i when i used to do tours in person i would ask people to try to guess what this is and they nobody ever got it right uh, so it's hard to guess but this is actually a system that we have in case our large large magnet loses superconductivity if that happens we need to get rid of 18,000 amperes of current and we have to send all that current through this copper it's not a cable i don't even know what to call it exactly bars uh, copper bars yeah Copper bars, it goes to the surface and that's how we have to get rid of it. So we can use, let me just change the angle here. We can use the opportunity, you can see where they're going. So we can actually show you guys some of the infrastructure, the, the systems that are required to run the detector. And in particular, we talked about the magnet. So in here is a lot of the equipment required in order to run the magnet. Uh, so I, I remember, a little bit of this from the shift training, uh, well, from the shift leader training, but not enough to tell you a lot. So maybe Sultan, you can talk a bit about the cryogenic system. Well, so um, we have superconductive uh, magnet in the in the middle of the detector that gives the name as well the solenoid uh, to the detector. Uh, we have to to cool it with uh, with uh, liquid helium. And indeed, uh, in order to, to, to get the liquid helium, we have to make it our, our own. So what you see on the picture on the left, this is the helium liquefier machine. This is an industrial product, so we just bought it. Um, uh, that's a sim well, simple, well, <laughs> <laughs> sorry about it. That's not a simple thing, but, uh, um, but can be bought indeed. Um, so that machine, liquefies the helium cools down to to 4.2 kelvins and uh, on the top of the machine that is the outgoing pipe that uh, runs between the, the liquefier and the helium reservoir uh, inside the detector cavern on the top of the detector and uh, that's the that's the amount of helium five cubic meters that we use to well pour down on the on the, the the solenoid to cool it down so in principle the uh, things should be uh, the cooling should be simple in the in the sense um, so when I when I learned about it I thought that this is very complicated how to cool down something to 4.2 kelvins yeah this is the this is the pipe um, and that goes diagonally in. Uh, so when I when I when I first learned about it, I thought that this is very complicated, and and one of the one of the cryogenic uh, experts just just told me that no 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 you have to pour down the uh, liquid helium on the the equipment as long as it boils. So just as a minor note, I hope you guys appreciate these tours. Uh, I know, you know, you can't see it firsthand, but. Even I've never seen this. I've never been up here. So these virtual tours allows us to show you guys some of the things you might never see otherwise. Yeah, no, this is great. Um, I'm thinking that maybe we should try and go in towards the actual detector because uh, we have only maybe 25 minutes more. Okay, we'll head over there. Uh, and if you can you also the stop SLR. in one of the service cavern on the way. Sorry, step stop where again? Uh, in 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 one of the um, the accounting rooms. Sorry. Yeah. So there's a question um, here about how uh, CERN is is funded. So 
CERN stands for the European Research Center, the European Center for Nuclear Research. Um, and so it is largely funded by the member states, which are most of the European countries, but also uh, various associated member states that the US is one of the associated member states. And so in the US, the funding is largely from the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy. Um, so it's, uh, it's fundamental research um that is supported by so it's it's really a wide international uh, so really quick this door this door leads to the lhc we're never allowed to use it uh, it's but yeah this these are sections of the experiment that lead to the lhc and i wanted to really really quickly i know uh i should really get to the cavern but maybe i can show you guys something i saw that eric boots was was trying to show and it's, I'm not going to be able to really show you guys. It's going to be too small. But this is one of those moments, if you know this, um, what's the movie where they're like, it goes to 11. Um, I forgot. But so our uh, current uh, voltmeter, if you will, it goes to 18,000. So this uh, dial on the right, I don't know if you can see it at all, or there's two dials for volts and then for current and the current one is measured in kilo amps so it goes to 18. <laughs> yeah exactly in our system uh, it is not the voltage that is high at least in the magnet the voltage is somewhere around uh, two volts probably uh, uh, at all and this comes from the the non-superconductive junctions of the of the system You want to set the funding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah, now we are entering one of the so called counting rooms. Um, and so I'm quite excited about this because it's very closely connected to, um, to the research that I do. So, just very briefly, um, CERN collides protons 40 million times per second. And each time the proton beams collide, um, it corresponds to about a megabyte of information. That means that just the CMS detector, the amount of information that is produced is 40 terabytes per second. And then you think that you run that for seconds, minutes, hours, days. There's no way that we could either read out all of the information or store all of that information. And thirdly, most of it is not actually that interesting to the type of physics that we want to do, because many of the processes that we are interested in, so for example, a Higgs boson is produced roughly once every 10 seconds, rather than 40 million times per second. And so we have the system, which is what they're showing you right now, which is called the trigger system. Um, and that very rapidly gets coarse information from some of the detectors to quickly, within a couple of microseconds, determine whether or not the particular proton-proton uh, collision seems that it, it is interesting, that it contains the type of physics that we, are, that we want to study. And if so, it sends a signal that, hey, this is interesting, we should read it out further, or no, this is not interesting, we can throw it away. And it's really critical because if we don't do this properly, we throw away the data and, and, and it really is lost forever. And so this is this first level of, of this trigger system is implemented in custom built uh, electronics uh, hardware because it has to be very, very quick. And so doing it in a as a regular like, like program in, a, in, in software on a computer would be too slow. And so, Luis, I can yeah. I very quickly just point out that I am I some of these are for sure for the trigger. So this is uh, BTF. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is part of the trigger system. But some of the things mm -hmm. I'm showing, I'm pretty sure are not. I think I showed some tracker. Uh, yes, well, that's right. This is TCDS. So so just to clarify, not everything is uh, that's exactly right. triggered that you see here. And some of it is upstairs as well. But, uh, you know, if there's anyone from Florida or, you know, I, I have a colleague who 
was always going like, go Gators. So I had to show that. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's another point. I think you already mentioned that this is a very, very large collaboration, but I think it's extremely interesting to me that, you know, you look at these modules, these electronics, and this it was, you know, there's a, um, yeah, so this is for DT, so the drift tubes is one of the muon systems, but all the electronics here are usually FPGAs that need to be, you know, the firmware needs, needs to be written. And in this case, I think CMAT, which is a, an institute in Spain, uh, contributed all that work. And you see that everywhere people have their stickers, you know, showing the work that they've contributed. Yeah, exactly. So, so the CMS experiment has over the order of three, four thousand people that are working on the on the experiment, from uh, students to scientists and engineers, um, technicians, and it's really a, a very large collaboration of of the of people. So, a, a very very brief remark before we go in. You can kind of see that we went around and these are where the electronics are. So we're gonna go through, but at the end of this little hall, uh, there's this wall and we're gonna, I'm gonna just point out that we're gonna go around this wall. This wall is seven meters thick and it's uh, that, it has to be that large in order to shield from irradiation, but also because of structural integrity in the cavern itself. So I'm going to go ahead uh, and scan again. This is another one of those tricky doors that reads your retina. And I'll try to do this in one go. Mm -hmm. So this is a yellow door. And the, the color really does matter in this, this sense. The yellow doors mean that when the, the accelerator is on and you break through them, you shut down the whole 27 kilometer ring for safety reasons. Yeah. And of course, so it, you will need to have a, a good explanation why you did this. <laughs> exactly. So uh, something else that's a little interesting is, nor right now it, it's not required because we're in this long shutdown, but during, let's say, operations when there are regular collisions, uh, when we do this and go through this door, we have to take a key from the, uh, just a booth over there. Mm -hmm. And as long as that key is missing, then the LAC doesn't work. So, uh, so here's that wall that I mentioned. You can see like it extends from here all the way down here. So I think we can finally, I'm sorry for the wait, wall. But, but we can finally welcome you guys to the CMS detector. <laughs> uh, so, Right now, the detector is, as you will see, actually pulled apart. So you can really see it in its uh, all its uh, beauty and glory. When we are running, when there is collisions in the detector, it is completely um, pushed apart. So the, the um, little thing that is sticking out that you can see here would be pushed into, so on the right would be pushed into the, the part of the detector on the left. And obviously that yellow platform is not. Yeah, exactly. So the yellow this platform is just for, would not this be is just for, there. To, to, to reach the... So um, a very, very uh, quick remark is that this is the visitor's platform where we are right now. And during a normal visit, this is all you sh would be able to see. But since uh, we're doing the virtual visit, we can actually give you guys a really proper tour. So I'm going to be walking around. I might say a few things as we go, uh, but uh, mainly I can just let you take over, Lee. Yeah, sounds good. And I'm going to start with that. Uh, you see in the middle here, there's a pipe that goes. Um, can you maybe just show that. Yeah, so sort of in the middle of the picture, there is a horizontal pipe. Um, which is the beam beam pipe. So that is where the protons, uh, the proton beams go through, um, and then they collide in the center of the detector. And again, the the CMS detector really sits like a um, it's kind of like a giant digital camera in a sense that records what happens in these collisions, what particles are produced and created. And from that information, we can deduce what happened in the original collisions. So a, a really quick thing is that the you pointed out the beam pipe, which is that tube 
I'll try to use my finger to point to it. So again, yeah, this is where the particles travel through. And uh, one thing that's interesting, it was just installed, uh, I guess a little bit before Easter. So this is a new beam pipe. And part of the reason we had to replace it is because we need a smaller diameter beam pipe in order to fit the next generation pixel detector, which is innermost in our detector. And in order to fit that very uh, sophisticated upgraded detector, we need a smaller diameter beam pipe. And that's not gonna happen for a couple of years from now, but uh, we're doing those changes now. Yeah. Where should we? So the what you see on the what you saw there on the on the right, uh, it's okay. You can you, yeah exactly here um, is part of the so-called new one system that is specifically the technology is specifically designed to detect and record new ones that um, that move through that that part of the detector. Yeah, I, I guess I can uh, very generally speaking, I should maybe say that. Most of what you see right now are the muon systems. And to be very, very clear, uh, we talked about the magnet and what you, I'm trying to point out the magnet, it's this silver looking ring, ring that goes around. It's, it has a six meter inner diameter. And again, it's a superconducting magnet. Um, so around that, everything around that, all the red parts are the, the muon systems. And since I can't really, unless I was, on top of that yellow platform, I can't really show you the innermost parts of the detector and you couldn't really be able, you wouldn't be, be able to see them anyway because they're sealed, uh, but you can kind of get a glimpse. Luis was, uh, I think, talking about the end cap and most of what you see here are muon systems. And we have actually now four muon systems, but what's also interesting is this, as we call it, this nose that sticks out, which of course, once you, seal your detector, everything, you know, that, that goes inside the magnet, of course. But you can see that, actually, we talked about the pre-shower, but it's going to be really hard for me to explain, but it's like a little, little thin part uh, right at the edge of that nose. Then there's this section here, which uh, should be the electromagnetic calorimeter, then the hadronic calorimeter. And we actually have some new systems just uh, on the edge of that nose, and those are where the gems are. There's a, a brand new... Uh, let's say forward muon system. Maybe a so quick they, word about this uh, red thing that's in my way. This is for alignment. And maybe that's something that a lot of people don't think about, but alignment is also very, very crucial when we talk about, the, about a detector. So we need to know where everything is in our detector because we have to simulate the path, the trajectory of particles. We have to make a simulation uh, have a computer solve some equations and we need to simulate even should we go yeah we need to simulate how an electron of a certain energy will interact with uh, brass or with um, you know silicon or carbon fiber all the all the materials that are in there so we need to know where everything is yeah, yeah. and actually position sensitive detectors if you if you use many position sensitive detectors uh, as the tracker or the muon system, you need to know that mutual positions. Yeah, exactly. So especially um, as Altan was also just saying, the the tracking detectors that trace electrically charged particles, they are able to um, the the resolution for how precisely they can trace a particle is sub millimeter level. And so in order to know with that high certainty where a particle went through, well, you have to know very well where the different components of your detector is located. So I, let me mention a quick thing. First of all, I think this is my personal favorite view of our detector. And I always say, if you ask me, it's the most photogenic detector there is at the OHC. I agree. And <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to also point out since we're here, let me just move a little, uh, well, I should go back. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna look up and you're gonna see the crane. The yellow but is then, again the crane. Yeah, but then you see all the way to the surface. So that is the axis shaft. And this is uh, the shaft that was excavated. I mentioned they had to freeze the liquid nitrogen and found some coins. Um, and one of the things that's also very remarkable is 
they had to lower this, uh, you know, our detector. I don't know if we mentioned, but it's yeah, made up of 15. About, OK. We talked a so little bit about this devices. in the beginning. Yeah. So the heaviest slice, I don't remember how heavy it was, but let's say uh, 400 tons, 500 tons or something. I don't remember. And not just that, but the clearance, it was very expensive to dig this shaft. So the clearance that was available was on the order of a few centimeters. You can actually some, I think I saw some other virtual, virtual visit and somebody pointed out that, well, the width, you know, this distance, uh, it's really hard to explain it, especially from here, but there's not a lot of clearance. Let's just put it that way. And this thing took a long time to, it was, it was very, a lot of people were nervous about this operation. Yeah, in, in general, any time when uh, any part of the detector has to, to be moved, um, there's a lot of, of engineering and, and technical expertise that go into being able to do that. Because so a uh, very quick thing, this is why we wear helmets. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> there are some underground hazards. Yeah, the, well, there's a lot more than well. banging your, Yeah, there's many, many other hard hazards that are not necessarily evident. And, uh, you know, for example, the muon systems uh, require a specific gas, gas mixture. Um, and of course, the cryogenic systems, uh, those are gases that can displace oxygen. So if there's a gas leak and somehow you don't, you know, it will displace the oxygen. Uh, you, if there's a gas leak of helium, you're going to know it because it's going to be very loud. But the point is, it can be dangerous. So we have to monitor the, the levels of oxygen. And we need to know how to, how to wear uh, or how to put on an oxygen mask very quickly. And so, so um, everything that you see here in terms of um, gas done. pipes and, and, and so on is, is also what um, the shifters in the control room are, are monitoring all the time to make sure that everything is um, as expected or as it should be. And so here you see another another view of the, the detector area. And you can see these are really, um, you see one, two, three different uh, levels, three different floors. So it's that gives you a, a sense also for, mm -hmm. for the scale again. Uh, yeah, so we're actually speaking of that, we're gonna, so we can't go through this way because there's uh, some sort of work going on, but we'll go back around and try to go to the surface and that gives you really a sense of scale of like just great. how big this detector is. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, yeah, and also it was mentioned that the detector is, is very heavy. Um, so the CMS detector as a whole weighs about, about 14,000 ton, or for scale, um, tw about twice the Eiffel Tower. And the majority yeah, of that is, the... yeah, the majority yeah, of that is, is coming from the, the solenoid um, everything around the solenoid magnet. And you might ask, um, we talked a little bit about this earlier, I think, why would you put the giant magnet in the middle of a detector that is trying to record particles? And the reason is that what happens to a charged particle in a magnetic field, well, it will feel a force and it will bend its trajectory. And we can use that information to deduce what is the momentum of charged particles. And so that's really critical. That's why we have this uh, solenoid magnet in the first place. So uh, maybe I can kind of say something that's related. So first, I was just going to make a joke about how we use the Eiffel Tower as a unit of weight, because Atlas is about the weight of the Eiffel Tower and then CMS is twice that amount. Um, and uh, just to really add to that, so we have, you know, you have the, let me just show this again. You have the superconducting magnet, which again is like six meters in inner diameter, but then all around, you know, our, what we call the muon system, it actually has a lot of steel. So those are what, when Luis said, it's like a majority of it is in, in the muon system. I believe all the red, that you see is steel. And that corresponds to 12,500 tons of steel in our detector.
So something also very interesting, you might ask yourself, well, how do you move it? How do you, uh, you know, open it up, close it up? So this is one of the ways that we do it. There is this uh, not very sophisticated motor, motor. And as far as I understand, it's being replaced sometime soon. But the real trick is that you have these hydraulic feet, uh, these orange feet here. What we do is we just uh, pump compressed air uh, enough to slightly lift up and make the, the each of the slices lift off the ground a little bit. And that makes it somewhat easier to move them around. So here's again the detector from the surface. And now we're actually really 100 meters downstairs. You can see also the shaft above us. Yeah, and so that's where we where we started earlier in the so-called SX5 building. And uh, this gives you more of a sense for how large the detector is. Um, again, shows the feet. And I think maybe Noemi is going to show some interesting um, thing related to the magnetic field down there. Do you want to do the trick, Noemi? The, with the, yeah, yeah, they're ready. So Noemi is going to demonstrate these are regular paper tricks. I feel like we're magicians and you got to show your, um, and you, there's nothing in your sleeves. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, but they're regular paper clips. And let me see if I can make this a little bit clearer. So what you're seeing is the effect of a residual magnetic field. The magnet is definitely not on. I think the phone might not even work if it were. So this is basically the, this entire red foot. You can see the, the orange foot is down there. So this is uh, steel and it's just magnetized. Yeah. Since it's been under uh, almost for Tesla for a while. So actually these feet are, are flat as you see, and they they tend to 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 attract us to, to put our laptops on the top and, and do the job from there, the hardware job. The however this remnant field turns off my Mac. <laughs> I mean the, the screen. Uh, so that's a pity. <laughs> yeah, this also happened that um, people have gone down when the when there was some magnetic field and there's very particular protocols for for doing that but someone who forgot to leave their wallet in the control room and had all of their credit cards deep magnetized and, and things like that um so yeah um let's walk around a bit more so we have we have maybe another couple of minutes so we should wrap up soon um but hg it, cal we have a pending uh, question about the so HG the hg cal is one of the detector upgrades so in about four years time roughly the lhc will be upgraded to a version that can collide protons at even higher intensities and this will mean that there's a lot of challenges associated with that from a experimental perspective. And so we are also upgrading parts of the detector. And part of that is the so-called HG Kyle, high, high granularity calorimeter. Um, and so that upgrade is, as far as I know, moving along well. Um, it is uh, still in, um, not really R&D stage, but late R&D stage yeah, being exactly. yep. tested, different components, different modules. Um, so, sorry, a very quick thing, sorry to interrupt, but you can kind of see here the division between two of the slices. And it gives you an idea of like just how close they are. Our detector is, I mean, I like to call it hermetically sealed. It's not quite accurate, but you know, compared to other detectors such as Atlas or God forbid LHCB, uh, yeah, it's very close to being there's no well, gaps in between. Yeah, well, indeed, it is accurate. So there is no particle path that could escape without uh, hitting the detector. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and related to this, there's, there's another question from, from Sean here, but what is the um, most in, ingenuous part of the method for measured particles? So 
I, I think what is everything. yeah everything exactly <laughs> there's there's so many different techniques and and um uh, and tools that go into this but but to me maybe one of the things that is just so amazing is that we are able to put all of this together to actually um, work and do physics data analyses and and just the fact that I don't know how many cables how many meters of cable there is in Siena but it's some insanely large number just like the the innermost part of the detector has what 90 million individual sensitive modules the pixel in the silicon the pixel, detector the pixel uh, is is almost 80 million yeah almost <laughs> so, yeah so so we have we have incredible large amount of well uh, well not <laughs> so if you if you just just grab your mobile phone your mobile phone is something like 20 million already uh so it is not it's not the numbers the what what makes really the difference is that we we take pictures 40 million times per yeah, second yeah, exactly. which your mobile phone is not not right. capable at all right right, <laughs> right exactly so it is it is rather the electronics behind the yeah. the individual sensing elements that uh, that is uh, yeah so something maybe just a very quick thing there, there's just i think i agree with luis and that there is so much complexity in running this kind of a detector and there's so many things that are not even about the detector itself and, and the physics, you know, like one of the things that has to be controlled is just how these caverns interact with each other. So right now you can see all the way to the surface. Uh, and this is the elevator shaft. And you can actually, if you look carefully, you can see that uh, copper tube or pipe or uh, cable, I guess, that I mentioned earlier. But when the collisions are happening, this entire uh, chamber is sealed and you have to very carefully control the airflow because you want air, you want uh, pressurization to come into the cavern and then exit any air that's moving around, any dust needs to go into the LHC because those that's the path of increasing radiation. What you don't want is dust to be exiting your cavern. And you can see that that has to be taken into account. And there's right here a radiation monitor, a radiation alarm, actually. So just that's just one tiny example. Uh, you know, the materials that are used to build the detector, so many things. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Um... So I, I think we, we need to wrap up. I don't want to answer the question that is in the Q&A here. So there, there's a question of um, how we test the systems before deployment, which I think is very interesting. And um, just one example is that we can use so-called cosmic ray muons. So muons that originate from cosmic ray particles that collide with the atmosphere and that are produced in these collisions that because of special relativity make it all the way down to our detector here on earth and we can actually record these muons and use them to calibrate and test the, the detector system and the whole readout chain. So from the collisions actually happening all the way to recording and storing and analyzing that data. And that's just, just one of the examples in, in the type of so-called calibrations and, and tests that, that we can do before taking physics data. And they're very, very important. They're really critical. Well, we use them for alignment as well. Yeah, yeah. For example, yeah. I talk against myself because I'm I'm working on the hardware alignment. That's a <laughs> uh, that's that's something that I find also interesting is that, you know, that's not the main. I, I when I started, you know, working in the field, I thought, well, the LHC is underground to you know protect from cosmic rays, but that doesn't work. You still get muons from uh, from outer space, so. It really has, in the case of CMS, it really has more to do with the, <clears throat> with the soil. So I mentioned the soil, that there's like a running river. So the, what is the bedrock itself is 100 meters underground. So that's where, you know, if, if you try to put twice the weight of the Eiffel Tower in the surface around here, it's just going to sink. So that's a bigger part of the reason we're so deep underground. Yeah, exactly. Um... So I think they're going out. The only have to scan, do the retina scanning going in, not going out. <laughs> it's going in, that's the critical component. Yeah, um, but, but you know, normally like here, I think I can actually open this. This is an example of how we would uh, 
get material through into the detector. And it's, uh, okay, I wouldn't say it's easy to get material into the detector, but getting it out is very, very, there's a lot of paperwork, let's say. So like, for example, here we have a, a storage area for any materials, sorry? Yeah, we call it a buffer zone. And this is uh, where we have to store materials that have been extracted from the detector itself. And, 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 and that, that's because it does get radioactive. And so there are very strict protocols to make sure that you don't accidentally take something from the detector that is radioactive potentially and bring it I mean, home with you, bring it somewhere else that it could pose any any dangers whatsoever. That's why there is such extremely strict protocols yep. to avoid, make sure that there cannot be an accident, basically. Yep. Yeah, so basically whatever seen the, the beam should be checked. Yeah. Part of my equipment is doesn't get radioactive, even if it's saw the beam, because that's that was so far from it, and the detector shields off. But I also have some equipment that happens to be radioactive. So if I want to transport it from here to my lab, first yeah, of all, right. my lab has to be able to receive it. Uh, that means that there should be a, a zone dedicated for radioactive elements. And also, um, uh, the transport should be organized very well. Right. So that's uh, because don't, don't forget that uh, mostly our labs are in Switzerland, while the detector is in France. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's another aspect. Um, yeah, and so. Um, I, I know I've gone a few minutes over time. If you have to go to another class, I, I fully understand. I'm going to stay on for another few minutes and just wait for um, for the people who were underground to come to the to the control yeah, room. Yeah, yeah. But if you have to go, um, no worries. Um, so um, yeah, I hope you've gotten a chance to to see a little bit about what it looks like here at CERN and, and some of the the challenges that that we have. Um, and actually uh, Luis, are you are you in this wall i don't know if there's a picture I, of you somewhere i am in that, that there right there you just walked past me striped oh, yeah, shirt yeah <laughs> cool. all right that's me some years ago uh with some hardware um yeah and and i mean all of this infrastructure again it's it's a it's a massive international collaboration we have um universities from around the world northeastern is one of them we are of the order of 20 people from Northeastern who are actively working on the CMS experiment um, on the muon system that we talked about and on the trigger system and the calorimeter system. Um, and this ranges from co-op students to uh, PhD students and, and faculty members and, and researchers. And, and we, we have people from um, most of the continents um, or all of the continents, I, I think, basically. Um, and it's all driven by this um, goal of trying to understand matter and the universe on, on, on a very small scale. Um, so thanks everyone for, for connecting and joining. I, I hope you enjoyed the tour. Um, thanks so much to Zoltan for the technical support and Remy for the technical support and also Andres who is now back here on surface for helping out uh, going underground with us today and this is um, just a volunteer thing so really really appreciated. Thank you all. All right. I think that's it for today. I'll stay on for, for a minute in case someone else has a, a question that you didn't have a chance to, to ask. but. Uh, um, that we have answered, yeah, the number of scientists we answered. Mm. Um, so, all right. Well, thanks again, everyone. And I hope to see you all on campus in the fall. Hmm. All right. Is that recording? Yeah, I will stop the.